Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter Jr., Brian Lynn, and John Russell. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Mario Ritter Jr. A United Nations report warns that pollution is leading to more early deaths around the world than the COVID-19 pandemic. A UN environmental report says pollution and toxic substances cause at least nine million premature deaths, double the number of deaths inflicted by the COVID-19 pandemic during its first 18 months. The UN blames pollution released by nations and by companies. The report called for immediate and ambitious action to ban some toxic chemicals. Results from the report will be presented to the UN Human Rights Council when it meets next month. UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, David Boyd, released the report Tuesday. He said that the ways nations are dealing with the risks posed by pollution and toxic substances are clearly failing, resulting in widespread violations of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Last October, the UN Human Rights Council voted to recognize the right to a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a basic human right. The resolution, which has no legal force, adds to the list of rights that the UN considers basic human rights. The report said pollution from pesticides, plastics, and electronic waste is causing widespread human rights violations. Pesticides are chemicals used to kill insects that damage plants or crops. The report also said pollution causes at least 9 million people around the world to die early or prematurely each year. The coronavirus is blamed for about 5.9 million deaths. The report urges a ban on polyfluoroalkyl, a manufactured substance used in household products such as cookware. The substance has been linked to cancer. It is considered a forever chemical because it does not break down easily in the environment. The report also calls for the cleanup of polluted places. In extreme cases, it urges moving affected communities. These include poor and indigenous groups living in what the report calls sacrifice zones. That term was first used to describe nuclear test areas where people could no longer live. Its meaning was expanded in the report to include any highly polluted place or a place where people can no longer live because of climate change. UN Human Rights Chief Michel Bachelet has called environmental threats 
The Biggest Global Rights Problem Environmental activists are increasingly using human rights laws in climate and environmental cases. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. American researchers say they have found the first evidence of a dinosaur being affected by a respiratory sickness. Scientists say the dinosaur appears to be closely related to the well-known Diplodocus family. The creatures are believed to have lived in the late Jurassic period from 163 to 145 million years ago. Researchers examined the fossilized bones from a diplodocid unearthed in 1990 in the American state of Montana. They found abnormal growths on three neck bones of the dinosaur. The team, which named the remains Dolly, says it appears the dinosaur may have suffered from a fungal infection similar to aspergillosis. It is a common respiratory sickness that often kills modern birds and reptiles. The sickness can also cause bone infections. The researchers said the condition may have killed Dolly. Aspergillosis is caused by inhaling particles from a fungus. It is the most common respiratory infection found in birds today. Birds are believed to have evolved from meat-eating, feathered dinosaurs called theropods. Dinosaurs suffered from sicknesses just like other animals, but evidence of sickness in the fossil record is rare. This is because soft tissue usually does not survive the fossilization process, which favors hard body parts like bone, teeth, and claws. In the past, dinosaur fossils have shown evidence of broken and healed bones, tooth infections, bone conditions, and cancer. But until now, no signs of respiratory infections in dinosaurs have been found. Kerry Woodruff led the research and co-wrote a study about the findings that recently appeared in the publication Scientific Reports. He is the director of paleontology at the Great Plains Dinosaur Museum in Malta, Montana. Woodruff told Reuters that Dolly was about 18 meters long and weighed about 4 to 5 tons. The dinosaur is thought to have died at between 15 and 20 years of age. Woodruff said the discovery provides new information about the medical conditions of dinosaurs, as well as details about the anatomical structure of the creature's breathing system. I don't personally know of any fossil I've been able to sympathetically relate to more, Woodruff said. Lawrence Whitmer is an anatomist and co-writer of the study. He is with Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. Whitmer told Reuters the dinosaur likely felt a lot of the same symptoms as people do. Poor Dolly, she probably felt terrible with all the same signs and symptoms of a lower respiratory infection that we experience, he said. 
Whitmer added that there are still unanswered questions about the discovery. Was Dolly so sick that she couldn't keep up with the herd? Did she die from this disease? Did she die alone? he said. Whitmer added that the evidence suggests the dinosaur was sick for an extended period. He said the fossils showed Dolly was sick long enough for the condition to cause reactive bone growth in the body. I'm Brian Lynn. Elton John's famous 1972 song, Rocket Man, appeared in a surprising way during this Winter Olympic Games. Skater Nathan Chen performed to it during the men's final freestating event, an event in which Chen won the gold medal. In today's Everyday Grammar, we will explore what this song can teach you about English grammar. You will learn how it uses an important structure for expressing future time, be going to. You will also learn how English speakers often use this structure in everyday speech and how it is similar to and different from the helping verb will. Let's start with a few important terms and ideas. Grammar books often describe English verbs in terms of tense. Tenses are forms of verbs that show when the action happened. However, these English verb tenses do not line up into clear groups all the time. For example, there are several different ways that English speakers can express future time. They might use the simple present or present progressive as in the sentences, she leaves tomorrow, or he's leaving this afternoon. But for the purpose of today's report, let's pay careful attention to two important structures that can show future time, the structure be going to and the helping verb will. In some cases, these two can be used interchangeably. That means one can be used in place of the other without a change in meaning. English speakers often use will and be going to interchangeably when making predictions. If you watch or listen to an American weather report, for example, you might hear either of these two sentences. Satellite imaging suggests it will be cloudy tomorrow. Satellite imaging suggests it is going to be cloudy tomorrow. Remember that in Elton John's song, Rocket Man, the structure be going to is very important. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time. In this case, the singer is making a prediction about the future. He could have sung, and I think it will be a long, long time. But perhaps the structure be going to sounded better to the songwriter's ear. Whatever the case, Elton John did not sing each word clearly. He connected some words and dropped out some sounds. He did not sing, It is going to be a long, long time. This is because in everyday speaking, English speakers often reduce words. Function words Words that have a grammatical purpose but little specific meaning are often cut short. This means it is going to be often sounds like it's gonna be. This is not slang or impolite language. This is just how people speak in many situations. There are situations in which will and be going to have different uses. We have explored this subject in detail in earlier Everyday Grammar programs. 
The next time you listen to music or news broadcasts in English, pay careful attention to how speakers use will and be going to. You will notice situations in which one or the other is used. Ask yourself why. And be sure to keep these two statements in mind. With time and hard work, my English is going to improve. With time and hard work, my English will improve. I'm John Russell. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Barbara Klein. And I'm Steve Ember. The stock market crash of 1929 marked the beginning of the worst economic crisis in American history. Millions of people lost their jobs. Thousands lost their homes. During the next several years, a large part of the richest nation on earth learned what it meant to be poor. Workers lost their jobs as factories closed. Business owners lost their stores and sometimes their homes. Farmers lost their land as they struggled with falling prices and natural disasters. And Americans were not the only ones who suffered. One of America's greatest writers, John Steinbeck, described the Depression this way. It was a terrible, troubled time. I can't think of any ten years in history when so much happened in so many directions. Violent change took place. Our country was shaped. Our lives changed. Our government rebuilt. Steinbeck, winner of the 1962 Nobel Prize in Literature, said, When the market fell, the factories, mines, and steelworks closed, and then no one could buy anything, not even food. An unemployed auto worker in Detroit, Michigan, described the situation this way. Before daylight, we were on the way to the Chevrolet factory to look for work. The police were already there, waving us away from the office. They were saying, nothing doing, no jobs, no jobs. So now we were walking slowly through the falling snow to the employment office for the Dodge Auto Company. A big, well-fed man in a heavy overcoat stood at the door. No, no, he said. There was no work. One Texas farmer lost his farm and moved his family to California to look for work. We can't send the children to school, he said because they have no clothes. The economic crisis began with the stock market crash in October 1929. For the first year, the economy fell very slowly, but it dropped sharply in 1931 and 1932. And by the end of 1932, the economy collapsed almost completely. During the three years following the stock market crash, the value of goods and services produced in America fell by almost half. The wealth of the average American dropped to a level lower than it had been 25 years earlier. All the gains of the 1920s were washed away. Unemployment rose sharply. The number of workers looking for a job jumped from 3% to more than 25% in just four years. One of every three or four workers was looking for a job in 1932. Those employment numbers did not include farmers, 
the men and women who grew the nation's food suffered terribly during the Great Depression. This was especially true in two states, Oklahoma and Texas. Farmers there were losing money because of falling prices for their crops. Then natural disasters struck. Year after year, little or no rain fell. The ground dried up, and then the wind blew away the earth in huge clouds of dust. All that dust made some of the farmers leave, one Oklahoma farmer remembered later. But my family stayed. We fought to live. Despite all the dust and the wind, we were planting seeds. But we got no crops. We had five crop failures in five years. <laughs> Falling production, rising unemployment, men begging in the streets. But there was more to the Great Depression. At that time, the federal government did not guarantee the money that people put in banks. When people could not repay loans, banks began to close. In 1929. Six hundred fifty-nine banks with total holdings of two hundred million dollars went out of business. The next year, two times that number failed, and the year after that, almost twice that number of banks went out of business. Millions of people lost all their savings; they had no money left. The depression caused serious public health problems. Hospitals across the country were filled with sick people, whose main illness was a lack of food. The health department in New York City found that one of every five of the city's children did not get enough food. Ninety-nine percent of the children attending a school in a coal mining area of the country reportedly were underweight. In some places, people died of hunger. The quality of housing also fell. Families were forced to crowd into small houses or apartments to share costs. Many people had no homes at all. They slept on public streets, buses, or trains. One official in Chicago reported in 1931 that several hundred women without homes. Were sleeping in city parks. In a number of cities, people without homes built their houses from whatever materials they could find. They used empty boxes or pieces of metal to build shelters in open areas. <laughs> People called these areas of little temporary houses Hoovervilles. They blamed President Hoover for their situation. So too did the men forced to sleep in public parks at night. They covered themselves with pieces of paper, and they called the paper Hoover blankets. People without money in their pants called their empty pockets Hoover flags. People blamed President Hoover because they thought he was not doing enough to help them. Hoover did take several actions to try to improve the economy, but he resisted proposals for the federal government to provide aid in a major way. 
and he refused to let the government spend more money than it earned. Hoover told the nation, economic depression cannot be cured by legislative action or executive decision. Many conservative Americans agreed with him, but not the millions of Americans who were hungry and tired of looking for a job. They accused Hoover of not caring about common citizens. One congressman from Alabama said, In the White House, we have a man more interested in the money of the rich than in the stomachs of the poor. On and on, the Great Depression continued. Of course, some Americans were lucky. They kept their jobs. And they had enough money to enjoy the lower prices of most goods. Many people shared their earnings with friends in need. Years later, John Steinbeck wrote, It seems odd now to say that we rarely had a job. There just weren't any jobs. But he continued, Given the sea and the gardens, we did pretty well with a minimum of theft. We didn't have to steal much. Farmers could not sell their crops, he explained, so they gave away all the fruit and vegetables that people could carry home. Other Americans reacted to the crisis by leading protests against the economic policies of the Hoover administration. In 1932, a large group of former soldiers gathered in Washington to demand help. More than 8,000 of them built the nation's largest Hooverville near the White House. Federal troops finally removed them by force and burned their shelter. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 